Welcome to the Copper Spice YouTube channel, and thank you for joining us. In this video, we are going to discuss the basics of multi-threading and develop a metaphor for designing a multi-threaded program. Multi-threading in C++. In this video, we're going to be discussing what multi-threading is, which will involve developing some terminology. We'll also be talking about the kinds of problems that multi-threading is good at solving, and when multi-threading should be used. One of the issues with multi-threading is programmers sometimes believe this is a complex problem, so multi-threading must be the answer. Multi-threading is not the answer to every complex problem. It should be used when it is the only way to meet your design requirements. This means that in order to learn good multi-threaded design, you will need to be working on a problem which has a good multi-threaded solution. The actual definition of multi-threading is very straightforward. It is simply the ability of a program to execute multiple instructions at the same time. This typically implies the ability for different parts of a program to be executing simultaneously. As a comparison, multitasking occurs when you have a set of tasks that are completed over some period of time. This does not imply that these tasks are actually executing simultaneously. They may compete for time on a single processor. This is a list of some of the observations we have heard from other programmers. A multi-threaded program is not inherently difficult to write. The truth is, a multi-threaded program is hard if the problem you are trying to solve is complicated. In order to write multi-threaded programs, we need to work with threads. A thread is a set of work which can be scheduled to execute on one core. And each thread belongs to a process, but it has its own call stack within that process. In a multi-threaded design, it is important to understand the difference between a thread and a process. A multi-threaded program consists of one process with many threads running simultaneously inside that process. These threads share most of their resources, so they are not isolated from one another. This allows the threads to communicate with one another in a very efficient manner. But this must be used with care, as failures in one thread can impact other threads operating in the same process. The only resource that the threads within a process do not share is their call stack, since each thread needs to know what work it is doing at any particular time. It must have its own stack, but all other parts of the process are shared. The threads in your program will be running on some number of cores. The number of cores physically in your computer determines the total number of instruction streams that can be executing simultaneously. A computer might have multiple processors, each of which might have multiple cores. And while a thread is active and running, it has exclusive use of a single core. In the context of multi-threading, a resource is considered to be anything which would be corrupted if two threads were to access it at the same time. If two threads access a resource simultaneously, and at least one of those accesses is a write, so it is modifying the resource, you have a race condition. And in C++, a race condition is explicitly undefined behavior. It is extremely important to avoid race conditions for correct behavior of your programs. As we've mentioned, the stack belongs to a specific thread, and this is the area of memory that is used for local variables and other data which is known at compile time. The heap, which is used by the runtime allocated data, is shared among all threads. So what sorts of problems naturally lend themselves to a multi-threaded solution? One attribute to look for is a task which can be split up into individual steps, and each step has clear inputs and outputs. This is very useful because it gives you a clear division of responsibilities when you break the task down into individual threads. 
If your task involves a small amount of I.O. and a great deal of computation, a multi-threaded solution is likely to be a good one. If you have a large read-only data set that needs to be processed in some way, this can also be done in a very straightforward way in a multi-threaded design. There are also a set of problems for which multi-threading is the only solution, but it is not straightforward because these are not simple to decompose into individual tasks. These problems arise when you have a large amount of resources, such as disk drives and network sockets that might be managed by an operating system, and a large number of external clients that will be making requests in an arbitrary order. Managing access to these resources in a multi-threaded environment can be very challenging, but an operating system which was not multi-threaded would exhibit very poor performance. So let's look at some sample problems. In this example, we have a kitchen, and there's two chefs, and there's two knives. These are the resources. We have a requirement to make 50 fruit salads. One solution would be that each chef would make 25 fruit salads. First question, is this the best approach? Here's what the code would look like. The first thing we do is set up a thread we're calling this thread chef1, and to the constructor of this thread, we pass a lambda. The body of this lambda is the code that will be executed on this separate thread. So this chef will simply make 25 fruit salads and then terminate. Chef2 will do exactly the same thing. And when we are finished starting both of these chef threads, we will join both of them. This means that this code will block until both threads have finished executing. In this example, our requirement is to make 50 apple pies. To do this, we're going to add a shared resource, namely an oven. What would it look like if each chef were to make 25 apple pies? At the beginning of this code, we set up our resource, which is an oven, and we set up a mutex to control access to this oven. A mutex is nothing more than an object which can be locked by one thread at a time. Then inside the body of the chef thread, we loop 25 times, we set up a new pie, make a crust, put the apples in the pie. Then we acquire a lock on the oven mutex and bake the pie. The second chef will do exactly the same. This means that while a pie is baking, it is very possible that both chefs will be idle. One is baking the pie while the other is waiting for access to the oven. So in this example, we're going to again have a requirement of making 50 apple pies. We're going to try a slightly different approach. What if we have one chef prepare the pies while the second chef actually bakes the pies in the oven? So now, instead of a mutex that controls access to the oven, we are going to have a conveyor belt that will move the pies from one chef to the other. The first chef will continually make pies and put apples in them, and then give the pie away by putting them on the conveyor belt. The second chef will take pies off the conveyor belt and bake them and do no other work. In this solution, the first chef never has to wait. They can make pies continuously until they are finished. The second chef is spending almost their entire time standing in front of the oven waiting for the pie to be finished. Depending upon how long a pie takes to bake versus how long the first chef spends preparing pies, this may improve performance. But the question is, can we do better? Can we optimize this design further? Could these threads ever cause a deadlock? Could they both get stuck waiting for one resource? And are there any race conditions? Will a resource ever be used simultaneously by two threads? This second solution to the apple pie example has some interesting properties. These threads can never be in a deadlock because there are no locks. There is no mutex to lock. And there are no race conditions because no resource is ever accessed simultaneously by multiple threads. The first thread makes the pies and then gives them away. The second thread cannot access them until the first thread has relinquished them. What if we have a scenario where we need two different products? 
If we need fruit salads and chicken salads, there are several ways we can decompose this. We can have each chef make one of each and do the cleanup. We can have one chef make all the fruit salads and have the other chef make all the chicken salads. Or we can have both chefs start working on the fruit salads, and when enough of them have been made, they can both switch over to making chicken salads. These solutions all have different properties and trade-offs. The first one may be fairly expensive if the cleanup takes a long time. We're doing a lot of redundant cleanup. The second solution may have one chef finishing before the other if fruit salads are easier to make than chicken salads, but this may not be a problem in your environment. The third solution guarantees that all of the fruit salads will be available as soon as possible, but with the complexity that both chefs now have to share a resource because they need to keep track of how many fruit salads have been made. The purpose of this example is to help you think about what a resource is, where your bottlenecks are, and the trade-offs that may be involved in structuring your solution differently for a given problem. So what if we scale this up to a commercial kitchen, where customers can order random items at any time? And now you have multiple chefs competing for multiple resources. The solution we're going to show today uses the facilities in C++ to solve this problem. In a later video, we will develop some higher level abstractions that make this code clearer and easier to understand. The first part of this slide is just setting up the resources that we're going to use. And the second half is the definition of the menu items that somebody could order. Our eat function is just going to log what food was served to a patron. We're going to be using a future and a promise to keep track of patrons and their food, and we're setting up a using here for readability. We have added an atomic Boolean flag here, so that while the restaurant is open, each chef just keeps processing orders. Here's the code that specifies what it takes to order a pizza. The work that this code is actually doing is setting up the chef ticket and the patron ticket and returning the patron ticket to the patron. As a side effect of this code, an order is created. This order contains all of the information about how to make a pizza. And because it contains the chef ticket, it also contains information about which patron this pizza should be delivered to when it's completed baking. It's important to note that the order pizza method returns immediately. It returns a patron ticket, a future, which is initially empty. At some later time, when the pizza has finished baking, the finished pizza will automatically be forwarded from the chef ticket, the promise, into the patron ticket, which is the future, and it will become available to the patron. This code takes advantage of many of the multi-threading features in C++. Futures and promises are a very powerful mechanism for communicating results from one thread to another asynchronously without race conditions. They depend on the fact that a resource is moved into the promise and transported to the future. This means that the resource is never available to both threads simultaneously and therefore cannot be subject to a race condition. This means that although we have to lock the oven, there is no need to lock the pizza that is being made. As a side note, if you are using C++14, this code can be simplified somewhat because in C++14 you can move capture values into a lambda. We had to use a shared pointer to get around this limitation in our C++11 example. In this kitchen example, there are many places where the code could have been improved. Adding more ovens might improve the performance, but at what cost? This is a list of some of the areas of improvement, but addressing these makes the code more complex and may not speed things up. You really need to know exactly where your threads are spending their time to improve the efficiency. 
Some general principles to keep in mind when designing multi-threaded programs. One common mistake is having too many active threads. This can really impact performance. It's best to aim for one or perhaps two active threads per physical core available on your hardware. It is also extremely damaging to efficiency when you have too much shared data. The most important part of multi-threaded design is reducing the number of shared data structures, reducing the amount of data in those structures, and reducing the number of threads that require access to them. Reducing the amount of shared data should be the main guiding principle in your entire design. And when shared data is absolutely required, see what you can do to make it read-only. Because read-only shared data is much less prone to race conditions and is far more efficient to access. For more information on CopperSpice and the other libraries we have developed, please visit our website at www.copperspice.com. Thanks for watching our video, and we hope you found the content of value. If you have any questions, feel free to email us or leave a message on our Copper Spice form. We'd love to hear from you. Please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and come back in two weeks for our next video.